Last year, he received a Grammy Award with the New Orleans Jazz Orchestra, uh, which he founded in uh, 2002. In New Orleans, he plays uh, a prominent role as a music entrepreneur, opening on Bourbon Street uh, the Irving Mayfield Jazz Playhouse and opening soon a new club. He's uh, 32 years old. He has uh, two lovely children. Yeah. And in Ascona he plays with a wonderful New Orleans uh, Playhouse Review with acclaimed uh, New Orleans musicians like uh, Don Vapi, Derek uh, Agdagat on saxophone, uh, Leon Kipchok, Chocolate Brown uh, on trumpet. Uh, today he enjoys a large popularity nationwide and internationally and we are very proud to have it in Ascona this year. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Irving Mayfield. Well, uh, for Jesus Corner, it's uh, an honor to have him here, back actually, because he came uh, how many years ago? I always say nine, but it's 12 years ago. 12, 12 yeah. 12 years ago, I first met him. Uh, no, uh, 14. Mm. 14 years ago, was it? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. At Marion's, well, I'm talking about this corner. <laughs> but, but I met him at Marion's in Bern 14 years ago. And uh, uh, there is a huge difference between then and now. Because then he, he, he used to come up and jam with me. Now he's back here uh, with a really great band and with uh, some awards in the pocket. To me, uh, Irving represents a little bit the change in New Orleans. Um, he, he, he started all his work before Katrina, but you can really feel it now uh, after Katrina. He's uh, setting a little bit the point uh, musically uh, in this city and uh, opening a club on Bourbon Street first. Second of all, having uh, different bands that uh, combine the best musicians in New Orleans. The best musicians in New Orleans also play in his club. Uh, he, he likes to combine young musician and old musician, the tradition of uh, New Orleans music with the modern side of um, jazz. So uh, before Katrina and after Katrina you can really see there is a change uh, going on. There is a life in, uh, in, uh, in the music of the city and uh, maybe he can uh, talk a little bit about it, but uh, um, I see New Orleans is keeping on with, uh, with the music big time, and it's thanks big part to him. So uh, uh, with this book, he, he, he also talks about uh, what the tradition is and what is now. And the CD also has this variety of, uh, of styles, so I don't talk much longer. <laughs> a little bit up to you. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> just a little bit about this book. Uh, the cover of it is a photo uh, done by the great Thank photographer you. Herman Leonard. And anybody who's a uh, jazz fan uh, loves Herman Leonard's work because in the 19, uh, late 40s on, he was the only photographer really to capture many photos of uh, the American jazz musicians, such as Charlie Parker or Fats Navarro or, um, I mean, all the guys. Very few people were taking any pictures and he were their friends. And so he was only taking pictures because he was a friend, not because he was an artist. And he didn't discover uh, all these photos until the 70s. 
when he went back and he looked at what he had, and he had some of the only photos, especially when you start talking about uh, musicians like Fast Navarro and uh, a lot of the bebop musicians, but he also had great images of Louis Armstrong. Uh, the images that he has, one of my favorite of Louis Armstrong is one where Louis Armstrong is sitting in a chair and he's not smiling. There are a lot of pictures of Louis Armstrong smiling. Mm -hmm. but there are very few pictures of Louis Armstrong looking very serious. Uh, you can see it's after a show and he's deep in thought. And what I thought was amazing is how uh, a photographer could get the opportunity to be alone with Louis Armstrong and have Louis Armstrong not entertain. Uh, so he's a, he's a great artist. He and I did this photo session uh, maybe about maybe about 10 years ago. And I never saw the photo until last July. Uh, and last July, I was in Los Angeles. Uh, he and my assistant, we were, we were all together. And I found out that he had leukemia. And on that day, it had been six months he was given to live by the doctor on that day. So he was now one day past six months. And he said he felt good. Uh, a month later, he was, he was gone. He, he, he died. Uh, and it was the first time I saw that picture. Uh, we did. From the session 10 years ago was last July, this picture. And I told them uh, I didn't like the picture. Because I said, you know, every other picture he has of Louis Armstrong and Billie Holiday and... Dizzy Gillespie, everybody gets a straight on picture. I'm the only person who took a picture, he doesn't show his face. So I, I couldn't understand, but you know, why no face image. And he said, no, 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 it looks good. Look, this is good for you. Um, so since then I've grown to like the picture and I uh, decided to use it for the cover of the book, which was very complex because now it is very hard to get a Herman Leonard picture. Uh, it has skyrocketed, and I, I don't know if they're even selling them uh, still. I know they stopped the sale of the pictures for a while. Uh, but he is a great, he's a great guy, and he knew a lot about art. Uh, and just a little bit more about Herman Leonard. His photos are unique because of how he placed the light. Most uh, pictures. Uh, the light is, uh, you know, somewhere towards the top of a picture coming down. He, his light is in the center, very, the strongest point, and he never used flash. I don't know how, you know, Herman Leonard, uh, he's a genius. I have no idea how he did it. Um, and he never looked at the pictures when we took them, you know. So he, he didn't, kind of like he's doing, he didn't do that. He, <laughs> he just took the picture, it was what it was, and he moved on to the next, uh, to the next shot. He was an amazing individual. Um, looking at getting someone to write a little bit about the book, I learned about uh, Soledad O'Brien from watching CNN. As an American, it's interesting. I, I grew up a little differently because Nicholas and I were hanging out 15 years ago uh, in Bern, uh, whether it be Locarno or being here in Ascona, or wherever we were, you spent a lot of time in foreign places, which most Americans don't, don't do. So the only TV that's available to watch is CNN. And so 15 years ago, I think CNN was a lot better than it is, than it is now. Um, <laughs> but what I like about CNN, I think that it is one of the most trusted international stations for America. And uh, this woman, Soledad O'Brien, she's done a bunch of stories in the last five years about defining America. One of her biggest stories uh, is called Black in America. And she did this story right as Barack Obama became the president of the United States. And so America did some introspection on what is it to be a black person. Uh, and so I was very honored when she agreed to write somewhat uh, about jazz and about New Orleans and about this book. And what she discusses in her foreword here, uh, she discusses the fact that I was not a good interview. Was I a good interview for you? That's good. Uh, and one of the reasons was because we got on the subject of my father 
who was a, uh, he was a victim of Hurricane Katrina. And so she asked me uh, some questions about that, and I really didn't want to, uh, to go into it. And then following the uh, interview, we had, you know, some good uh, conversations, and uh, we became friends. And I think she started to understand what makes New Orleans music uh, special. Uh, and why it should be special not only for people in New Orleans, but why it should be special for people uh, in America. So I think she did a pretty good job of writing the, uh, the foreword here for the, for the book. The purpose of the book uh, is to, I think I'm a very misunderstood uh, musician because I like to do a lot of different types of music. Uh, and if you listen to the CD, uh, that comes with the book, uh, right here. There's music that, there's music with uh, Ellis Marcellus and I, uh, the legendary New Orleans piano player. There's music that's recorded uh, on location in Havana, Cuba. Uh, there's music that uh, shows the Mardi Gras Indian uh, tradition of New Orleans with the chants and the African uh, chants. There's music uh, that deals with the funk period of the 1960s. New Orleans, a lot of the musicians from the 60s in New Orleans went to California and recorded mostly uh, all of the American hits. Ray Charles, Patti LaBelle, all of these are the New Orleans musicians in the back and I have a musician, bass player named George, George Porter, who I use on here. So there's some 60s music. There's music about the uh, lynchings uh, the lynchings of uh, black Americans in New Orleans that I have that uh, features an 80-piece chorus. There's music with a 70-piece uh, a philharmonic orchestra. Um, there's gospel music with a gospel chorus that we put together with Devell Crawford, who's also here. Uh, and there's also a second line with the Rebirth Brass Band and the great trumpet player Kermit Ruffins and uh, Troy Trombone Shorty Andrews, who's now becoming a very well-known jazz musician. Uh, there's a track with my mentor, Wynton Marcellus, on trumpet. So there's a lot of different work. Uh, I don't know if you have a word for schizophrenia. And, uh, schizophrenia. So maybe I'm a schizophrenic musician. <laughs> Can I ask a question in between? You named uh, Wynton. Uh, what's your connection to him? Uh, well, he's one of my mentors. And uh, when, I, when I left college, I, I went to the University of New Orleans, and I'm a professor there now, but I left, uh, flunked out after three, failed out after three semesters. And uh, I left the, the University of New Orleans and I moved to Manhattan, to New York City, and lived with Winton for three years. And it was some of the best, uh, best study, that very influential time, uh, about the same time that I was coming here to, uh, coming to Ascona around the same period, maybe a little, a little after. Uh, but I moved in and lived with him and studied with him uh, for three years. So it's kind of like the relationship between uh, maybe Rimsey Korsakoff and uh, Igor Stravinsky, you know? Uh, I got to learn a lot about music and a lot about, a lot about art. Uh, the way the book is put together, there are 14 essays and 14 songs. And each, uh, each song uh, and each essay talks a little bit about what's behind the music. Uh, so for the, and there's a little bit of poetry, because, you know, I like poetry. I'm a, I'm a big poetry fan. Some of my favorite poets uh, probably be, uh, Pablo Neruda would be up there. Uh, Baudelaire would probably be my second. And then for a good Irish poet, because you always need one Irishman. Uh, probably be Yates would be my my third favorite poet. So there's a little bit of poetry, uh, a title, and then an essay. And the first uh, the first essay is about well, it's called Mo Better Blues, and I've been playing this song here on some concerts. Uh, but it's really about trying to play jazz uh, in my time, uh, which was hard. One of the reasons it was hard because all of the movies. Uh, all of the stories you hear about jazz musicians are really bad stories or bad movies. Um, if, there was one movie, uh, Round Midnight, 
and I talk about this in the essay. There you and know. he has a bird, 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 yeah. absolutely great. Great movie put together well. Yeah. Forrest Whitaker was the, and I talk about this in the essay, yeah. Forrest Whitaker was the, uh, I think he, he was the actor who played Bird. Yeah. And Clint Eastwood was the director. Yeah. Of course, he's a big jazz fan. Yeah. And in Round Midnight, Dexter Gordon, yeah. uh, ooh, he was, uh, what was his name? But for, uh, he, played, uh, he played the saxophone. Yeah. You remember what his name was? Yeah. Whatever it is. But now, great movie to watch. Not a good movie for if you want to be a jazz musician. Because what do you learn in these movies? Dexter Gordon has no money. No. Uh, he's, you know, a drug addict, uh, you know, no one's listening to his music, uh, you know, it's a, he stays in this small apartment, you know, Charlie Parker, you know, is on heroin, he throws his saxophone through a glass at a recording session, he dies at 34, 34. one year older than me. And they thought he was 60 mm -hmm. when he died. So this is, this is hard for a young musician to want to play jazz. So when I was about uh, 14, Spike Lee. It's interesting music. Sorry, yeah. so. <laughs> More better blues. <laughs> More better blues. But it's different. Mm -hmm. Denzel Washington is the trumpet player. You know, good looking guy. You know, they have some performances. You know, they have nice places they live. Wesley Snipes, who is an action movie hero, is the saxophone player. This movie was very inspirational uh, because I think it showed jazz in a today's terms. And it still had issues and challenges. Denzel Washington had two women. <laughs> you know how. <laughs> uh, and, you know, uh, they were trying to figure out why Black Americans don't listen to jazz. And so it was a lot of issues, but I think uh, it was a great movie for making someone want to play jazz. Uh, and so I write about this and play this song because it's kind of a anthem uh, for me because it made me believe in jazz as a profession, something I could do and uh, spend, my life, spend my life with. And if anybody has any questions at any point in time, you can just stop me and ask a question. There is, uh, in the new generation, uh, the important, uh, uh, I'm French, sorry. <laughs> okay. uh, no, uh, people like Winton, uh, Nicola Payton, you, who have taken lessons with legit trumpet uh, teacher like uh, Ron Benko. So, no, you, you have uh, a knowledge of the trumpet uh, from the classical roots, too. of course. Uh, what, is it important to know uh, to have these roots uh, for a jazz player? But in yeah, the, well, in I, the past, it was not the same. Well, I think that all of the uh, all of the arts have a classical foundation uh, as a fine art form. I think even when you think of African drums, you know, New Orleans is known for its African drumming style, but it's classical. Mm. I mean, if you go and study the drums of the Yoruba. You know, thousands, millions, some say millions of years old. I mean, it's a very classical form. It's important if you know that, that only enhances your approach of the rhythms of what you're playing. Mm -hmm. uh, and even if you don't know what you're learning, you're learning the history and the tradition. I think that's why the history and tradition is so important to Nicholas, because I think he knows the importance of it. Whether the musician knows it or not, it is important. So of course, uh, for the harmonic side, the European tradition is, uh, you know, it's, it's important and it's, uh, it's expansive uh, because you have so much uh, effect, uh, especially, say, from New Orleans, from the French uh, composers. I mean, we took a lot uh, from them, but also um, the Russians. I had a lot to put the Germans, <laughs> and of course the Italians. Uh, if I had to think of a similarity between, say, New Orleans and the approach of the Italians, would be phrasing. Uh, you can hear it in Cuban music, uh, when, how people sing over the music. Uh, you know, you listen to the phrasing of an Italian opera. 
uh, is over, not in in the time, but over the time. But it's the same thing as you listen to Louis Armstrong play our trumpet players. We play over. Do 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 de, 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 de. But we push. We don't. We play over the the time. So that's the phrasing. So there's a lot borrowed. Um, I think from that, and I don't like to think of even the word, the term borrowed is not good. It's a continuation, really. Uh, I don't like the term European classical music or African uh, folk drumming because I think these terms uh, treat music as an island. And music, music is music. Music is no island. Mm -hmm. Music is music. music. Is music. Um, it's one of the things I learned in this next essay from working with uh, Bill Summers. Uh, here and Bill is a uh, amazing musician. I first learned about Bill and I write this essay. Uh, but one, let me say, coming to Ascona became a problem for me in my early career uh, because Ascona was known as a festival for two types of musicians. If you're from New Orleans, you were either a brass band musician, uh, and at this point in the late 90s. That was not a good thing, unfortunately. Uh, it's stupid uh, because New Orleans was built, which is why I have this music on my CD. Uh, but it became a bad thing to have played in a brass band, uh, you know, uh, for, for whatever reason. And then you had the traditional jazz musician. And what that meant in New Orleans was you were not modern. You were not uh, an intellectual uh, you could not approach the music from a high level. You were not Terrence Blanchard. You were not Nicholas Payton. You were not Wynton Marcellus. You were not Donald Harrison. You were not a part of the New Orleans, New York legacy. And because I spent so much time in Ascona playing with, at that time, uh, Harold Dejean and Milton Baptiste and Olympia Brass Band. I mean, Ascona used to have the all of the old bands that don't exist anymore were here. It's where I learned how to play play with the LGS Brass Band. I could not hear this music at home because there was no one place you could go and hear. Here you could come to Ascona, you could hear all of the music in one week. <laughs> Learn all of the songs. Uh, and so I did. Uh, it was amazing, but unfortunate at home, uh, it put me into a box. So I was a Brass Band musician, then I became a traditional musician. Uh, and then when I was 20, I started this band with Bill Summers. Bill Summers was very interesting because Bill Summers was even worse to, to the modern jazz world than a brass band or a traditional musician. He was in the funk period. <laughs> so he, uh, his record, he, his first record he recorded on uh, was with Herbie Hancock and the Headhunters, which is a famous, famous, famous uh, record. It was. Uh, Herbie Hancock on keyboards, Benny Moppin on saxophone. Who's the bass player? Uh, Paul Jackson. Paul Jackson on bass, uh, Harvey Mason on drums, and Bill Summers on percussion. I mean, you know, this is a, anybody into jazz, and some everybody's got this record. You have two records in your collection at first. First record is Kind of Blue. Your second record is Herbie Hancock and the and the Headhunters. You know, if you're playing. And so when I had an opportunity to put a band together with him. We came up with the concept that we would do all danceable music. That's jazz. We wanted to play music that was hard to play, that would be challenging, and we wanted people to dance all the time. So uh, we thought Cuban music people can dance to, uh, Brazilian music people can dance to, Jamaican music people can dance to, the Haitian music people can dance to, the steel pan calypso music from Trinidad people can dance to, uh, the uh, merengue music from the Dominican Republic people can dance to uh, and people can dance to New Orleans music so we thought this made a lot of sense and it gave us an opportunity to look at jazz in New Orleans from a Caribbean aspect and it never had really been done singularly. General Morton always talked about the Latin tinge in the Caribbean uh, rhythms but never before had a New Orleans group said we're gonna get deeper into the Caribbean. We've gotten more deep into the European tradition, more deep uh, into being a part of the American songbook fabric, but never really Caribbean. So I then became, well, I named the band 
los hombres calientes. Uh, for two reasons. One reason is there was a rap group called the uh, Hot Boys. And there's this rapper named Lil Wayne who's a big pop star now. And he was in his rap group. He actually went to high school uh, at the same time we were in high school. He went to high school with my friend over there. Uh, so he had a group called the Hot Boys. And to be funny, I thought it would be hilarious to name a band the same name as the rap group. And so, but I couldn't name it in English because it already existed in English. And because I was international, from spending so much time in Switzerland, <laughs> I decided to name the band. It was either going to be French or Spanish. And in French, the name didn't come out, no offense. It didn't come out as, as well as in Spanish. Uh, but in Spanish, we thought Los Niños Calientes uh, didn't have the right stately manner. So we decided Los Hombres Calientes because of the hot gentleman approach to it. So everyone thought we were a Latin band. So then I became from a brass band musician to a traditional musician to a, <laughs> and now a Latin <laughs> musician. And we won a lot of Latin music awards. And this was at the time when Buena Vista Social Club took off. This band started at the same time. And uh, we actually beat them that year for the best uh, album of uh, the Billboard Awards in America. At the Latin Billboard Awards. And we show up to the Latin Billboard Awards in Miami, and I speak no Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone, they think, um, you know, they think I'm Latino. And so they're talking to me, and they I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they were very upset to find out that <laughs> a band named Los Hombres Calientes was from New Orleans. <laughs> uh, so this was an interesting period. But I learned a lot about music from the world. Learned a lot about the Brazilians and their rhythms. And we all have a rhythm in common. New Orleans, Brazil, Haiti, Jamaica, Cuba, Trinidad. Um, and the rhythm is a rhythm that goes. You know this rhythm. Nicholas is a drummer, so you should. <laughs> but it's a, uh, it's clave. And clave is a old rhythm. Old is one of the oldest rhythms, and you find it even if you go to the bush uh, from the Yoruba people. And that's the. Now in Cuba, they play it backwards. In Cuba, it's. In Brazil, it's the New Orleans way. And the relationship to the clave is uh, different, but that's we would look for that rhythm everywhere we go. It was great uh, exploring it. For one record, we recorded in five different countries. Uh, we recorded in Cuba, Jamaica, Haiti, Brazil, and uh, the craziest experience I had, and then I'm going to my next essay, was being in uh, Haiti. Because in Cuba we found all these great drummers, like in New Orleans, um, like in Brazil, but in Haiti, the drummers are another level. I mean, crazy amazing. When we got to Haiti, we didn't even tell anybody we were coming. And this guy sent, who we never met, who we never talked to, sent someone to the airport to get us. It's very strange. We get to the airport, uh, a guy named Simba, who was maybe 6'2", six, 6'3", six, looks like a basketball player with the dreadlocks, says, uh, I have come for you and have been sent by Jean Ramon. So we get into the car uh, in Haiti, and we go all the way to the top of a mountain to this hotel called Hotel Montana, which is a beautiful hotel. And we get to the hotel, and this is Haiti, and I'm pretty afraid and scared. And uh, with Bill Summers, and he's quite comfortable at home because uh, he's a drummer. And drummers are happy when they're around drums, I've come to find out. Uh, so we, we get to the hotel, and we, I ask the people, I say, where should we not go in Haiti? And they say, do not go to the place where there are no lights. If it gets dark, you'll be killed and you'll never. So we drive down about an hour and we wind up in a place where there are no lights. And this is where we stay for three days. <laughs> and uh, they, they bring in one light on a generator. One <laughs> light. There are no lights anywhere. There's no irrigation. There's no sewer. It's just houses, one light for three days. Uh, and we have a voodoo ceremony for three days. And they make uh, beans and they make rice and we go through the ceremony. And in Haiti, which is interesting from other places, 
in Cuba or in Brazil, women play dr drums alone, men play drums alone. The same thing in, in Brazil, in Cuba, in the Dominican, in Haiti, men and women play drums together. And in Haiti, they play with hands and they use a foot. They'll lay the drum on the side and put the foot and the hand together. Amazing, amazing stuff. And when everyone else, everywhere else, Bill is a master percussionist. When Bill Summers played in Brazil and in Cuba, the highest level of respect because he knew their rhythms. In Haiti, he took a lesson. He could not learn the rhythm. This is a master percussion. He could not learn. And the rhythm was, I couldn't hear what was wrong with it. He would, guy would play, bump, 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 bump. And then Bill would play, bump, 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 bump. Guy says, no! And Bill would go, bump, 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 bump. no! And so then finally did this, and then the guy just walks away. He says, ah, Americans, no. <laughs> Haiti. And so when we left, I said, Bill, I asked Bill, I said, what did you think? He said, the, they have the purest form of the drum. Still, it was untouched. It, it didn't change. Everywhere else, when the drums got to Cuba, they changed a little bit. When it got to New Orleans and Congo Square, it changed a little bit. But in Haiti, no change. And here's the thing. When we did sessions in Cuba and in all these other places, we paid very well. In Haiti, they would not accept our money. The poorest country we went to. They would not accept, uh, maybe it was ten dollars or $15,000. They wouldn't take the money. And the reason was, they said, because it was not the purpose of the drum. So you couldn't pay for it. So we had to donate the money to a school and for instruments for them to even want to receive it. Uh, it's a powerful, powerful uh, experience. Any uh, questions so far about any of that? This uh, next essay, uh, discusses why I like writing, uh, my favorite type of song in jazz is the jazz ballad. I love ballads. Um, I love Ella Fitzgerald's ballads. I love Billie Holiday's ballads. I love Abby Lincoln's ballads. My favorite is Sarah Vaughan. Her ballads are just breathtaking and, uh, and amazing. Um, ballads are an opportunity to deepen emotion, uh, I think, in jazz. Um, and as a young musician, it is very hard to play a ballad well. Uh, so in this essay, I start off discussing about creating ballads. Uh, and I like to write ballads also. And it starts off saying that when I was 20, my uh, girlfriend at the time, uh, right around my ass going days, my girlfriend broke up with me uh, and told me she was in love with another man. You're a French. You should know this story and, and like it. Um, and so I went and wrote a song. Well, I wrote a whole CD about this experience of the girl and she winds up going to But she just didn't want to be with me anymore and that kind of a thing. Uh, and I wrote the song about it. Well, I wrote a CD. Uh, I think it was nine, maybe nine selections. Uh, about it, and uh, what I learned was two things. A, if you have a broken heart, it doesn't make a good, you know, doesn't mean you can write good music, you know. Uh, and the second thing, it doesn't make you feel any better after you write a, <laughs> write, write a song. Um, Does it make you feel any worse? Uh, I don't think it makes you feel any worse, but you know what it is? It's uh, interesting because it always brings you back to a point in time. I think one of the most powerful things about music as an art form, music is a space marker. Where I don't think theater or visual arts or dance is as much. But music, uh, because it's in the same space as emotion, is the type of um, it's the type of thing that can take you back to where you were at that moment in time. Um, one of the greatest musicians I've ever worked with who taught me about ballads is uh, Ellis Marcellus, who is a you know, wonderful piano player. And he was my instructor uh, at the University of New Orleans, but he was also the first person to teach me a jazz scale. Uh, I guess when I must have been about 10 years old or so. And uh, Ellis, the best thing he does 
his play balance because he creates these amazing introductions and these amazing endings. And it sounds like they have been written out somewhere. Uh, it's tremendous to hear him, uh, to hear him play. Uh, and his rule uh, of playing a ballad that I learned was, if you play a jazz ballad, you should know the words, even if you're drunk. <laughs> so you should know, because you need to know what the song is about. Uh, you need to know why the song was created. And then you can create inside of that framework. Uh, so I think that's a very important part of tr tr tradition that I think is lost a little bit now. Most musicians who don't sing don't learn the words to the uh, ballads. And there's some beautiful words like uh, Hoagie Carmichael's uh, Stardust. It's beautiful uh, poetry there. Uh, this next section is my favorite picture in the book. And I think it speaks very much so about what makes New Orleans a great place. This is not a special day. This is not a celebration that the city does citywide. This is just some day in New Orleans where some people got dressed up in all green and green leather at a local neighborhood bar and had a band and these folks uh, called the Social Aid and Pleasure Clubs, along with the Mardi Gras Indians. You think this is normal if you grew up in New Orleans. You have no idea that if you come to Switzerland dressed like this, people will look at you like you're crazy. <laughs> Here's another beautiful picture of two, two Indians. And you had some Indians yes. you brought last year? Donald Harrison, two years ago. Big Chief. Uh, you have Big Chief Donald Harrison here. You know what it looks like when they... But imagine a hundred people like that. What we do uh, from going to Haiti and going to Cuba and going to Brazil, I decided to look at New Orleans like a little island. So I called together all of the Big Chiefs. And in New Orleans, two Big Chiefs are never in a room together at the same time. This is very complex. <laughs> um, and there in New Orleans, Canal Street divi divides the city in half. And there's downtown and there's uptown. And there's a different way to do things downtown than it is to do things uptown. You play the tambourine one way downtown. For instance, Shannon Powell and Harold and Raleigh are from downtown. So they slap. They slap the tambourine. But Cyril Neville from the Neville Brothers, he's from uptown. He punches. And you can tell where somebody's from, from how they play the tambourine. And you don't play punch style when there's a slap style. Just the tambourine alone is its own thing. What I liked about this opportunity was to show not the colors of the feathers, but to show the music of the Indians. And the music goes all the way back to the slave chants. And so when you listen to all of the Mardi Gras Indian songs, you hear the call and response uh, like the slave chants or the uh, chain game. So you hear somebody say, shoe fly don't bother me. Shoe fly don't bother me. I mean, same kind of thing you would hear back in the um, early 1800s uh, kind of approach when someone may be, uh, be shipped over from uh, Cuba to work the cane fields uh, at that point in time, sugar cane in, in New Orleans. Uh, the music is amazing and there's special rhythms, uh, like the Indian beat, which is. Of course, you have clave over it, which is. It's not taught. You just, you don't get a lesson, there's, there's no, it's not written in a book, there's no, it's just, you show up at this bar on Tuesday night, people are sewing their suits, uh, someone takes and starts to play it, and people play strange instruments, like the beer bottle. There's a whole discussion about which beer bottle we should use. <laughs> should we use a Heineken? 
The bottle should be used. And a Heineken bottle is one of the best bottle, bottles that you can use to play. And when you hear the band coming down the street, the, the bottles make this interesting bird kind of... It's this whole thing moving with these folks in these suits. Uh, so we brought uh, Big Chief, Don Harrison, we brought Cyril Neville. Uh, we actually brought Shannon Powell, who's from downtown. He was allowed to come in. We had <laughs> Shannon. Uh, we had uh, Big Chief Bo Dallas. Uh, the only person I could not get was Tootie Montana, who was one of the legendary Big Chiefs. Uh, he turned me down, but we had everybody in the studio at one time to record this song called Old Time Indians. And it's, it's a wonderful, it's one of my favorite uh, tracks, a wonderful track, and I enjoyed it. Um, I think, Ron, you should talk a little bit about Booker. Uh, we recorded, and Ron and I is a piano player who recorded this uh, song together. But let me just say that this man here, in these pictures, taken from the historic New Orleans collection, was one of the most creative American geniuses and redefined uh, the piano. Uh, and I say that after saying Jelly Roll Morton really uh, defined a tremendous amount of piano in America and in the world. He took what Jelly Roll Morton did and took it to the next level. Uh, and very few people uh, know of his music or know about him, but he's amazing. He had a tremendous uh, appetite for classical, Euro the European classical traditions. He was a big Chopin fan and could speak it very well at the piano and rework it. Uh, he was also crazy. He was, he was out of his mind. He, uh, he thought he was being investigated by the CIA. You guys are familiar with the CIA. Uh, he thought he was being investigated. He, uh, there's a legendary story where one of the Beatles put out his eye. So he wears a patch. Uh, he, you know, he was wild, but he played the piano, and he's really the one that took the happy hour approach. You know, little light piano, and made it great. He never played grand pianos. He didn't like a grand piano. He couldn't do what he wanted to do on a grand piano. And you can see him here uh, in, let's see, 19... 73, I believe, and he's playing a uh, upright piano in front of thousands of people. I mean, you know, you know, he's an amazing character, but you want to say a little bit more about Jason? Irvin spoke a little earlier about one, one of the descriptors used to define New Orleans as this melting pot, and America is referred to as a melting pot also, but musically and culturally, New Orleans, because of its geographical location, is definitely a melting pot. Urban spoke about the drum rhythms in New Orleans coming together as a, as a consequence of all these different cultures and people coming with a New Orleans piano style, which I can't think of any other place that has a, a geographic location that has a piano style. Now you have approaches, there's a Russian approach to classical music, there's a French approach to classical music, there's a German approach to classical music, but I wouldn't say there's a, because I play a little classical music, I wouldn't say there's a German style. There actually is a style of piano that can only be described as New Orleans because of the mix of styles. Much like Jelly Roll Morton, James Booker studied a lot of different types of music. And uh, one difference between Jelly Roll, I think Jelly Roll actually had it in his mind. He, he, he set out to create this thing and to write it out. It was very purpose. James Booker, however, was just a fantastic musician. He played classical music, he played Hammond B3 organ in church, he sang, and as a result of all of this and his very eccentric personality, he created this amazing style that, like Irvin said, was Jelly Roll 50 years later. B Booker was born, I believe, like in the late 40s or the early, early 50s, and he played rock and roll piano, he played jazz music, he played classical music, and then he just created this style that no one else came close to. Uh, What's the piano player, the, the one that most people know in New Orleans? The, uh, the, 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 the Professor Long here. Yeah. Brilliant piano player. 
nowhere near as prolific as James Booker. Just technically, artistically, and again, I'm not taking anything away from Professor Longhair, but James Booker was a genius. And he was almost clinically insane. So you put all these things together, uh, you had a, a brilliant musician. Uh, Irvin spoke about the happy hour approach. What James Booker did in New Orleans was he turned happy hour, which generally is a time where people go and they drink and they mingle and there's some background music. Well, Booker was not a background musician. He turned happy hour into a concert because what he did on piano was just unheard of. It was amazing. He was brilliantly, uh, he's technically proficient. He was a composer and had an interesting raspy, bluesy voice that sounds like it's something from the early, early 19th century while he's out somewhere, you know, in a cane field or somewhere in a cotton field. We do, we do a performance, uh, and we've been doing it every day, of a song we wrote called James Booker, which shows the style. And if you come to the concert tonight, I don't know what time we're playing. You don't know either. Um, whatever time we're playing tonight, uh, you'll get to hear the style and the approach, and Ron is the one who recorded it on a piano. Um, we've come to recognize and Ron's daily job is to be the CEO of the New Orleans Jazz Orchestra. We've come to recognize that if we don't uh, understand and live the tradition, then it either dies or it gets misrepresented uh, or it's not, uh, the important pieces are not saved. Things change all the time. Music changes, you know. Uh, even the classical repertoire, an approach would change uh, people, I've, I've heard uh, just recently, I uh, listened to uh, uh, Tosca, the opera, uh, the conductor changed, he says, I really think Puccini wanted it to be this way. <laughs> changes all the time. What's important is that the important, the magic, is saved. Uh, and so we've come to recognize that it's, we have to know the magic uh, so that whoever it is, when it goes from where it goes, when it leaves New Orleans to where it's going next, that the most important pieces uh, go along with it. Here's a little bit of a, a good story for you. This is one of my favorite stories in the book because it's one that is not necessarily too much about uh, music. It's not too much about music, but it's about an international travel experience. Uh, one of the things I started to do uh, in New Orleans uh, after the hurricane, uh, being the ambassador, I gave a lot of speeches about culture. And so I was invited to Florence. You guys may have heard of this place, you know. Uh, Florence for the 40th anniversary of their flood, the Florentine flood, 40 years. Uh, and I was invited to give speeches every day with Senator Ted Kennedy, who, you know, was John F. Kennedy's brother and was very, uh, you know, important in the Senate. Uh, in, in America. And so for about seven days, I would give speeches with Ted Kennedy, and I would go second. That was the idea. And he was supposed to speak for about 10 minutes, and I was supposed to speak for about seven minutes. And so I get to Florence, and they were really disappointed when I showed up, because at the time I was 29, and I think they were expecting, you know, the mayor or someone with a lot more uh, gravitas uh, from New Orleans, and uh, they got, you know, a 29-year-old black jazz musician to come give some speeches. And the council general, uh, <laughs> she was so upset. She just told me upon meeting her, she says, well, they say you're good. I really hope so. I really hope so. And so uh, a couple other things happened. All of my suits were lost on the plane. I flew Air India. All of my suits were lost. The only thing I had was, ironically, a CIA t-shirt that, that was given to me by some officials in America. So I'm in Florence. You know how Florentines are. I'm in Florence with a CIA t-shirt. It's my only travel. And I have to do these uh, press conferences and sign these you know, uh, friendship packs and peace treaties and give these speeches. And I have no clothes. So the first thing I had to do was get a new suit. And it was right about this point where the Euro really came into its own. And I had to buy a, I wanted a tailor-made suit. Uh, and I was used to coming to Europe from 10 years earlier where you go and 
you know, you could get a lot from the U.S. dollar at that point. But no longer the euro <laughs> was two to one. I didn't remember those days. It was two to one at this time. And uh, I don't know, the suit cost me, I don't know, 2,500 euros or something like that. So once I got the suit, the guy brought it to my hotel. I put it on. All of my luggage showed up. So I was having a bad day. I go down to the speech, and we're in this amazing room called the 500 room. And it's the room where Leonardo da Vinci has a fresco on one wall, and Michelangelo had a fresco on the other wall. And we're sitting there, and all of these mayors from uh, Sicily and Budapest, and from, of course, Florence and Ted Kennedy. And they're all speaking, and then Ted Kennedy gets up, uh, well, you know, Ted Kennedy gets up and gives his speech. And he's, well, and they love Ted Kennedy and Florence. Let me say that. Because he came down 40 years earlier when the Florentine flood happened and rescued the paintings in the water himself. Took a plane over. Uh, John F. Kennedy and, and Jackie O. sent him over. He came over and was rescued. So he had a fan club. And they had, you know, posters and he was screaming, go Ted Kennedy. Uh, and so then I stand up, the guy who had the CIA t-shirt on earlier, and he speaks for 30 minutes. He's supposed to speak for 10 minutes. He speaks for 30 minutes. And so when I get up to speak, nobody's interested in what I have to <laughs> say. And um, I start off my speech by saying, um, you know, thanks on behalf of the governor of Louisiana and the mayor of New Orleans. You could just see people in the audience going, oh <laughs> And so I said, you know, I need to do something. What can I do? You know, these, these, these Florentines, these Italians, I need, to, I need to wake them up. I need to get them interested. So I said, I went down to see Michelangelo's David today. And for all of his greatness, it was lacking something. And, you know, they were... They were awake. <laughs> they were listening. <laughs> and they were ready. And then I said again, you know, for as great as it was, it was missing something. And you could just see the quarantine is like, we're going to kill him. <laughs> we're going to, he will not make it out of here alive. And then I said, for all of its uh, brilliance, and I don't know if you've ever seen the David in person, but it's large, it's, big, it's magnificent. And you can, to, to see the hands, it's, I mean, it's pretty, he's pretty, Michelangelo was pretty good. Uh, but what I, I recognized was that whether it be Michelangelo, or whether it be Baudelaire, or whether it be uh, Liszt, or Beethoven, or Shakespeare, or Louis Armstrong, was that no art has the ability to love. We try. You know, you, you can see Michelangelo spent however long, how many ever thousands of hours to create this very important sculpture. But a sculpture cannot, cannot love you. Uh, a piece of music cannot love you. Uh, it will not love you. You can't feel that love from it, but it is, it's the love that makes you desire to create it, have the aspiration to continue to try to accomplish it. And I think the real beauty, the true beauty of art is the fact that an artist will create even in spite of the fact that he knows his work would always be a failure and never accomplish that. But he's trying to attain something that can never be caught. To, you know, to, to try to catch a fish that is not catchable. Um, and I said, but people can love. Cities can love. And I thought that at the time of the 40-year flood from Florence, and at this point maybe two years of what happened with the levees being broke for Katrina and New Orleans, that we were there to be people, to help each other, to love each other. And that's what art reminds us of. Art is the... Art is the best of what humans create. Everything else that leaves and dies and goes, those aren't the things that are important, but the art is the stuff that stays. It's the people we still talk about. List, 
Rachmanoff, Louis Armstrong, uh, Tuba Fats. The art is amazing. Uh, and it reminds us what we should be trying to be, to love. Yeah, so that was my, uh, my speech in Florence. And needless to say, Ted Kennedy and I became pretty good friends. And uh, he stopped speaking before me. He started speaking after me. Then he started to steal pieces of my speeches. You know, he had a speech writer so he could take some of my speeches. But he, it, was a, it was a great experience for me. And I think uh, the Florentines learned that sometimes a jazz musician can talk too, right? Um, this piece is really interesting. I, I'm a professor at the University of New Orleans. I'm the director of the New Orleans Jazz Institute there. Uh, Ellis Marcellus. Uh, was the first jazz studies chair, so I'm in the, the legacy lineage of, of Ellis Marcellus and the work that he created at the University of New Orleans. Uh, one of my students asked me uh, a few semesters ago, why would I create a piece on lynching in America? Uh, there was a fantastic book that was created called Without Sanctuary, uh, which is a document a documentation through photographs of lynchings. It's ugly stuff. I mean you see people with the, the noose and a rope and all these pictures. And my student wanted to know why would I create something about lynching or about slavery or why why would I do that? And one of the things I think the directors, uh, especially a lot of the Jewish directors have done well is to understand that when you tell a story, uh, sometimes the art is a place where you can tell a story that may be too hurtful or too complex to have with words. Uh, that the, the art can bring people together to have an honest discussion or honest conversation about it. Uh, and I thought that lynching in America, lynching wasn't something that happened only back in the 1800s or even in the 1950s. I mean, there were recent lynchings uh, in the late 90s um, in America. You would think that's something that doesn't happen. It's important to have these discussions, and I think as an artist, uh, it's a unique opportunity. I don't believe that every artist, you're not going to search much uh, of, you know, Miles Davis's music and find a lot about lynching or slavery. Uh, I think in Louis Armstrong's music, some interesting songs like Black and Blue, where the context is really, <laughs> really heavy. Um, but I think uh, America still has a lot to be discovered about the black American and the white American in that relationship and how it developed. And I think as a, even as Barack Obama being the, the president, uh, America still has a lot, of, a lot of discussion that needs to happen. Um, and art can be the best way for us to, to do it. So there's a song and a piece that I wrote uh, that's called Lynch Mob. And it has a chorus and it has uh, a group of people singing String Em Up. Yeah. String Em Up. And then there's a lead soloist who's kind of the head of the lynch mob kind of saying all of these things that should happen to this person. And I think it was important just to remind people and to continue the discussion about uh, what has happened there. Uh, this next essay is about my time when I went to live with Wynton Marcellus. You asked my relationship with Wynton. Uh, when I went to the University of New Orleans, I had a full scholarship to the Juilliard School. And Ellis Marcellus, Wynton's father, told me I should not take my scholarship at the Juilliard School and that I should go to University of New Orleans. And his logic, his, his, the reasoning behind this was, name me the last great trumpet player that graduated from Juilliard. And I couldn't think of, <laughs> I couldn't think of any. So he advised me to stay in New Orleans, to go to the University of New Orleans and figure out what I wanted to do. So I went there for three semesters and uh, I did, it, it, it didn't work. I mean, I, I flunked out, bad grades, left the university. And then I had the opportunity to go and stay with Wynton Marcellus. Wynton is, uh, he is an interesting person. One, because when you think of New Orleans, 
Um, I think he is an example of this newness that you're speaking about where he's someone who his first record was recorded with Herbie Hancock, like Bill Summers, with Herbie Hancock and Ron Carter and Tony Williams. Uh, but you also, you know, very modern jazz group. But you think about all the work he's done to uh, focus on New Orleans, uh, working with Danny Barker, working with all the old New Orleans musicians, and building the first institution uh, at Lincoln Center for jazz. Uh, you know, he plays a very important role uh, in the music, and I got to live with him at the three years when he won a Pulitzer. He was the first, uh, he was the first black musician to win a Pulitzer Prize. Duke Ellington won it, and they took it back from him uh, when they found out he was black. So Winton was the first uh, music, black musician to win the Pulitzer, uh, and has you know won all these other wonderful awards, uh, 13 Grammy Awards. 40 honorary doctorates from Princeton, Yale, and Harvard, and you, know, you name it, he's, he's done it. But when you live with him, he has no awards in his house. You will not see a Pulitzer, you will not see a Grammy, you will not see none of it. It is in his house. Um, he does not have a driver, he takes taxis, takes the subway, uh, and he's funny. He tells a lot of jokes, and he doesn't sleep. And we used to have this, we used to have this ongoing challenge. As being a young student, I would try to wake up before him in practice. So I would wait until he had a performance that ended late at night. So maybe he would get in at midnight or 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. And I would wake up at 8 a.m. And I would start practicing. So, you know, I would wake up at 8, 8 a.m. and I'd get ready to go brush my teeth and I would hear him already practicing. So, okay, next day he gets in at 3 a.m. I wake up at 7 a.m. Brush my teeth, I hear I'm already practicing. <laughs> so the next day I wake up at 6 a.m. and you know, I get in there and practice, and he walks in from the grocery store and he says, I've already done an hour. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't sleep. Um, he is, he taught me, the most important thing he taught me was that it's not about learning jazz, it's about understanding art. Art is no island. And that when you appreciate literature, and visual arts, and architecture, and poetry, uh, the art will speak to you in a special way. You'll understand the magic and the power of the artist. I think that's one thing that has been lost uh, in this recent generation across the board. The great jazz musicians don't know the great writers anymore. And the great writers don't know the great visual artists. And the great visual artists don't hang out with the great architects. And the great architects don't hang out with the great dancers. I, I love seeing the pictures of Picasso, Hemingway, and Nijinsky all being in the same place at the same time, investigating what everyone's doing. The, the way that uh, Ralph Ellison and uh, the wonderful writer and Romare Bairden the great uh, African-American painter, and Duke Ellington all hung out, knew what each other were doing, what was going on at the Harlem Renaissance period. I think we've missed that. And the music doesn't have as much value uh, because of the relationship to the, to the art. And so that's kind of what, I've, uh, what I did learn from, from Winton. Uh, I'm getting close to the, to the end here, so let me know any, any questions you have. One of the most complex things about New Orleans, and we experience this all over the world, I learned this when I first came to Ascona. The world thinks of New Orleans as Louis Armstrong, which is great if you play trumpet <laughs> and you play jazz <laughs> and you love Louis Armstrong. It's not good for you <clears throat> if you play the electric bass. Um, but New Orleans didn't only just create jazz. New Orleans also created funk music. The drum set was created in New Orleans. All these, all these things happen in New Orleans that a lot of people just never really have learned about. Uh, this, this guy, George Porter, is an amazing, amazing bass player. And back in the 60s, he and his group, uh, the, the Meters, 
basically were the backup band for all of these great 60s musicians. Uh, so Patti LaBelle, or like I talked about, um, you know, even a lot of the stuff that James Brown and his band were, were copied from what these guys uh, were doing. And everyone in the 60s wanted a New Orleans drummer. Um, you know, I think that's why Nicholas loves the New Orleans drummer so much. There's a certain, you can call it funk or certain rhythm uh, that is taking place in that. Or maybe, I don't know if you want to join in and kind of have a discussion about, about the George Porter thing, but Ron and I used to investigate. We got to this period where we investigated funk records, but we would try to really figure out what's funky and what's not funky. And more times than not, every time we checked out what was funky, George Porter kept, <laughs> he kept coming up. We kept finding him. Like, this is funky. Who's that? George Porter. Like, oh, it's George Porter. Uh, and so the funk music, uh, I think it's unfortunate that when you go other places, people think of jazz as being, I play 1920s jazz. I play 1940s big band jazz. I play 1960s jazz. In New Orleans, we don't, we play music. You, you, it, you never, I never had to say I play jazz, I just, I play, and you play, and it's fun, and whatever it is, is what you play. Uh, and you didn't, if someone's playing an electric instrument, it wasn't a turn off. Uh, it's about the sensitivity, uh, the beauty that can be brought with the music. And George Porter and I worked together on this song, and he's just, he's just so ridiculously uh, amazing. Um, one of my final chapters in the book uh, talks about the record I did with Ellis Marcellus. I don't get nervous very much. I was never nervous when I met the President of the United States. I wasn't nervous when I met the President of Hungary. I wasn't nervous when I was with the Archbishop of Canterbury. I don't, I don't get nervous. Uh, but I get nervous if I have to play with Ellis Marcellus. You know, it's just the old thing of a stu student playing with a teacher. And uh, Ellis and I did this record together with symphony orchestra, uh, and it's love songs, ballads, and standards, uh, and it was great. And we recorded it live and in the studio. I'm really happy. It was one of my, uh, pro mo one of the records I'm most proud of. When Katrina happened, and my father died uh, in Katrina, uh, I, I wasn't really concerned anymore about the record. So the record was supposed to come out. We never put it out. Uh, because it happened right, we finished it right before Katrina. And um, after some time passed and I got over my father's death, um, I said, I maybe it'd be a good time to put the record out. So I called the guy at the studio and he said all the tapes had been saved, we could put the record out. He would call me back that day. He didn't call me back for a week. Then we found out that the water in New Orleans didn't get to the music, the tapes of the music. But the heat, you know, in New Orleans right now, it was what, 98 degrees when you left home? 98 degrees, 100% humidity. That's what? And 34? It's pretty hot. It's hot. And imagine that. Imagine that for a month. So all the tapes were lost. And I usually take all of my recording sessions and keep them on my iPod. Once I'm done with a recording session, I erase the iPod, because I don't want to hear it anymore. I want to go to the, once I'm out of the studio and I'm done, it's for the listener, I'm on to the next thing. But for this one session, I did not erase the tracks on my iPod. And so the engineer took the rough mixes from my iPod, and we were able to put the entire record up. And if it was not for that iPod, this record would not exist. In Katrina, I lost so many, you know, like everybody, I lost all of my high school pictures. Having a, a, a flood, an entire city be flooded, you know, and your family's there, your cousins won't have pictures, your aunt won't have pictures, you won't have those things that you had your entire life. You won't have the mementos that got saved from your grandparents. So I had no pictures of my dad. And I tell my two sons all the time that uh, I hear better than I see. And that this record actually serves to me as the pictures for my dad because this was the last project that I worked on when he was around. And he was very proud to uh, have me working with uh, Ellis Marcellus. And you can see here, 
uh, this picture of Ellis, who looks like he's six feet tall even when he's sitting down at the piano. One of the great folks I think you guys should check out, and this is a little bit outside of the jazz room, is a guy named Gordon Parks. Gordon Parks is an amazing person. He was also a significant photographer like Herman Litter. He was the first significant African-American photographer. Uh, he, I was commissioned um, in my early 20s by the New Orleans Museum of Art to do a jazz piece based on his entire life's work and to perform it for him. At the time, he was about 93. And he came to New Orleans and I played the work for him, but I got to learn his life story. He started off taking pictures uh, in his late 20s because he was starving. So he lied to someone and told them that he was a photographer and started taking fashion photos. In his 40s, uh, late 30s, he became a writer uh, just because someone told him he should start writing. In his 50s, he became a director of movies. He created Shaft, he created the first black exploitation uh, type of movies. His first movie was one called The Learning Tree. He went on to later create, create Shaft, and he became the director and he wrote the screenplay. Uh, he also became the first person in America to do a major story in Life magazine on favelas, uh, going to Brazil, he uh, ran into this young guy named Flavio. Uh, he wound up adopting Flavio and kind of exposed to the world uh, the living conditions of third world countries. Uh, I mean, he was just an amazing person into his on and off. He also was a composer. He composed his own music. He couldn't read music. Uh, he came up with his own way of notating music and played the piano beautifully. Uh, so when I did this piece, I asked him to record a piece that he wrote with me. And he wrote this beautiful song called Wind Song. And he loves Ravel and Debussy. He thought of himself as a uh, French Impressionist, uh, as, a, as a composer. Beautiful music. And he played the piece for me at the piano. I said, we should record it. And he said he didn't feel comfortable recording because he had never recorded before. He had only written the music and someone else would record it. So I said, look, you're Gordon Parks. And so at 93, Gordon Parks came into the studio and did his first recording session, and only recording session. And we recorded together this beautiful song he wrote. He said it was really meant for an opera singer, uh, maybe a Leontine Price or somebody like that. Uh, but he was really happy with the recording. He's since been gone now for a few years. But I think uh, it's a really valuable piece. And it's the only actual recording of him playing his music himself. So that's one of the best reasons, I think, to buy this book for the price that we sell it. Um, and finally, I'll end with these two essays. Uh, my mother has a saying, she says, my mother has a saying that goes, blessed is he who gets paid for what he would do for free. Uh, I did an interview the other day, and the guy asked me, he said, well, you know, you're a businessman. And, you know, you've been really successful. Uh, I think it's funny, because I, I remember Nicholas when <laughs> he, was, he was an assistant at a jazz club. You have to really love jazz to be an assistant at a jazz club. <laughs> and he worked at this jazz club, and I was, uh, we were both teenagers. And we loved this music, and we just wanted to, <laughs> we wanted to be in it. He wanted to play drums. I want, and I think this music uh, has brought us to where we are now. But it's the love of it. I see the passion of it by still seeing brass bands come down the street. You know, Ascona is the only music festival where you can learn about music. You can learn about music from a certain time in a certain way. Even in New Orleans, if you go to the festival, you don't learn it that way. Ascona is the only music festival where it's presented in such a way where over and over again you can, you can hear a style and really know what 1920s, what that was. There's a lot of investment in that. And a lot of it is not done with New Orleans musicians. A lot of, a lot of it is done with all of the great 
musicians from Europe. It's tremendous. Uh, what I think is so great about the European appreciation of the arts is what made the Florentine flood so special. It's that everybody came from all over to Florence to save the great European treasures. No one called them Florentine treasures. I feel the same way when I hear New Orleans music being played here. That it's the world's music. Louis Armstrong gave it to the world. Jelly Roll Morton gave it to the world. It wasn't meant to stay in America. And it wasn't meant to stay only for black people. You know, people had to come together and it takes more than one to play to make it great. Um, in New Orleans, I think it's one of the things that makes it such a special city. It's because the music is probably the only real place where democracy exists. Where you can be an individual and a group simultaneously at the same time. You, you are required in jazz to be yourself. You can't be someone else. We are, it doesn't sound good. Um, you can't do what the other musician is doing. I can't play what the trombone player is playing. He's going to be mad. I can't play what the clarinet player is playing. That's not going to work. I got to play with the trumpet player. And if there's two trumpets like I have in my band, you got to really carve out your space. And it's connect the understanding. We can all have a conversation. But it's not only about being an individual or being different. It's also about trying to make him sound good and make him sound good. And I think um, this music is still one of the best examples of people working together that exist today. And the irony is that it's so celebratory. You don't preserve New Orleans music. You celebrate New Orleans music. And the celebration was born out of the funeral. All jazz music got created out of church music, the funerals, uh, the social aid and pleasure clubs <coughs> came together to help poor black people be able to bury themselves. And what you got at a funeral, you had a preacher, a church, a band, a military style band with a sousaphone and a trombone and clarinet, and you got the graveyard burial site. At this point in time in New Orleans, the graveyards were very close to the church. Most churches had a burial site, actually. Uh, and you would get the band would play as the person who died came out in a box, in a casket. They came outside, the band would play these slow church songs known as dirges. And the slow church songs may be songs like I Fly Away, or it's songs like uh, Just a Closer Walk With Thee, or it's songs like Oh When the Saints Go Marching In. It's pretty interesting to think of Oh When the Saints Go Marching In as being a death or a funeral song and being played slow. Uh, and the way it worked, the band would play, and you go to the graveyard, and the preacher or the priest would give the rites of passage, and then the band would play the same songs away from the funeral. It was really important not to play any different music. And you would play it away from the funeral, and the folks who were really sad, if you were in the family, you would consider the first line. You wouldn't join in the ceremony, the celebration of going to heaven. Uh, but everyone else who could would join in in a celebration of speeding the music up, and that would be considered the second line. And, you know, and at Skona right now, it's probably, what do you think, 80 degrees, Ron, 85 degrees? Well, in New Orleans, this time of year, it's 98 degrees. You have a suit on, you're wearing black, you're at a funeral, you might want to have an umbrella. So you have an umbrella, and if you've been crying, you're at a funeral, you have a handkerchief, and this band is coming, and they start speeding the songs up, and they're coming down the street, and all of the other people are now in this second line. And as you get further away from the graveyard, more people join in. And the way it works in New Orleans is uh, if you get away from the graveyard, maybe let's say three or four blocks, you might have 40 people. At eight blocks, you might have 100 people. At 12 blocks, you've got 400 people. They don't know who's dead. They don't care. <laughs> Everybody's joining. It's a party. You know, people 
uh, it is what it is. That is, I think, one of the most uh, celebratory aspects of New Orleans and really of now. Is that jazz is a paradox. It's the funeral and a celebration together. It's the individual, solos, improvisation, and the group together. And I think New Orleans is one of the few places where you can live this type of a lifestyle. It has its challenges. It's got its troubles. But in the music, uh, we've been really, really lucky uh, to experience that. And I think that all of the New Orleans musicians, from Louis Armstrong, uh, Freddie Keppert, to Jelly Roll, to now even Nicholas Payton, or Wynton Marcellus, or myself, or Shannon Powell, or Herlin Riley, we love to share that with people. It's, it's, it's very hard for us when we see people listen to the music and they don't dance to it. It's strange. We don't get it. We, when we see people sit there, we, <laughs> why aren't they dancing? Why, you know, what is it? In New Orleans still today, you could take a clarinet, a trombone, a tuba, and a bass drum and go to a high school and start a riot. People know what to do. And we want to bring that to the world, and I think that's what the world understood about Louis Armstrong, and that's what the world understands about New Orleans, and I think that's why my good friend, Nicholas, uh, has me here today, and that's what this book and CD is all about. I call it a love letter to New Orleans, but I think it's really a love letter from New Orleans, uh, with this disc and some explanation and some photos of not what it is to be in New Orleans, but what it is to be alive to be passionate, uh, to know that you're here right now, in, in the now, and to uh, share love with people. It's, you know, it's a great life and I'm really thankful for it. And I thank you guys for listening to me uh, talk a bit here today. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Any uh, questions? How, how long has that taken? This is the culmination of how many years of work? Uh, this is about 13 years of work, but I wrote the book in uh, three weeks in Brazil. Mm -hmm. I didn't have anything else to do. So I just, I wrote the book out. And, and because of having, soon to have now two clubs in New Orleans, uh, and, you know, uh, having presidential appointments and doing a lot of different things, I run into so many people who, who, don't, who may know a little about me, I wanted to have something where people could understand the work uh, that I'm doing and my philosophy that I believe in. Uh, and I think this book is, a, is an easy way to make happen. But maybe Nicholas should print up some versions in German, uh, French, and uh, Italian. Maybe. Any other questions anybody has? Well, I'm going to say uh, in Italian, grazie. <laughs>